Step 5. Photomultiplier tubes. In this final step of this lesson, we will briefly discuss uh, a very important application of the photoelectric effect. So, this application or technology is known as photomultiplier tube, and it's one of the early applications of the photoelectric effect. And it's used in the scenario where a current is produced when a light is sufficiently high of sufficiently high energy strikes the detector. So we saw in previous two steps that in order for photoelectrons to be ejected, we require height of uh, we require light of certain frequency. In particular, the frequency of the light must be above some cutoff frequency nu c. So let's imagine that we are trying to do a very fine measurement and we are trying to detect a single photon. So a single photon strikes our metal and we assume that its energy is above this uh, cutoff frequency or cutoff uh, energy given by the work function. So we know that a single electron will be ejected from the metal. But since we only had a single photon, it's going to eject only a single electron. This will produce an electric current, but detecting such a tiny current is really difficult. It would be much easier if we, if we had a way of somehow producing larger current, even though we started with a single uh, photon. And this is exactly the job of a photomultiplier tube. So let's see how it works. The basic setup for a photomultiplier tube is given by this following diagram. We have a vacuum chamber, and at the, one of the, at the end, we've got a photocathode. This is basically our metal material that is used as our detector. So the photon comes in, represented by this wave package, wave packet here. It strikes the photocathode. If it has frequency higher than the cutoff frequency, it delivers energy more than the uh, work function of the metal, and a, uh, and a photoelectron is ejected. Now, in order to catch this photoelectron, we have a set of dynodes, and their function uh, will be explained very soon. But there is also a voltage applied between the photocathode and each subsequent dynode. If, if you see, these voltages are increasing to higher and higher values. What that does, it accelerates the ejected photoelectron from the metal. So, our one photoelectron gets ejected and accelerates towards the first dynode, where it hits the surface of the dynode. The job of a dynode is, when it gets hit by an electron, that produces two or typically three more electrons. Now, these electrons are then accelerated towards the second dynode that's at a higher frequency, a higher voltage and so on and so forth in an avalanche of electrons being produced as we go to further and further dynodes at higher and higher voltages. So starting from a single electron, we can multiply these electrons and after a couple of cascades, we arrive at typically million electrons, producing high enough current for us to detect and record. So what are the important parameters? that tells us, tell us about the sensitivity of such a detector. After all, detecting single photons is not very easy, but uh, the, uh, the picture that we drew was relatively simple. Of course, there is no such thing as a perfect detector, so we must weigh, have a way of quantifying the sensitivity of a detector. And there are two important uh, parameters that capture um, the sensitivity of a detector. One is known as the photosensitivity or the responsivity. We're going to denote it by PS. And it's simply given by the number of amps of generated current per watt of incoming light. So PS, the photosensitivity, really is the current that we can detect over the power of the incoming light. So it's simply given as I divided by P. The other important parameter, also quantifying a detector's sensitivity, is known as quantum efficiency, QE. And that's basically the probability that a photon is detected. And it's given as a ratio of the number of electrons ejected from the photocathode uh, divided by the number of photons that are incident onto the, uh, onto the um, detector. So you see, if the number of electrons um, that are ejected is the same as the number of photons, then we should have uh, quantum efficiency 1. So it's given by this ratio, Ne divided by n gamma.
where Ne is the number of electrons and N gamma is the number of photons. Often, we don't use the abbreviation QE for quantum efficiency in quantum technologies, and simply we call it eta, Greek uh, letter eta. So, is it easy to go between the, uh, these two parameters, between the photosensitivity and quantum efficiency? As we will see in this slide, yes, yes it is. So, as we said, the photosensitivity PS is the total current, which is really given by the total charge per unit time, divided by the power, which is energy per unit time. So, let's compute. What is the total charge? The total charge is simply given by the charge of a single electron times the number of electrons, so E times Ne. And it's divided by some time delta T, which is our detection time. The energy per unit time, remember, this is the power of the incoming light, is given by the energy of a single photon, H times nu, using Einstein's logic, times the number of photons. That's the total energy. And again, because we are uh, using power, we have to divide by the same time delta T. So we see that the delta T's cancel, and this ratio, Ne over N gamma, it's just our quantum efficiency. So we have the following relationship. The photosensitivity is basically the same thing as eta, our quantum efficiency, just renormalized by this factor over here. So PS is equal to E divided by H nu, the energy of a single photon, times eta. Or if you want to express it, express it in terms of the wavelength, it's in the following form. E times lambda divided by HC times eta. In the following, in the following um, lessons, we will go into the quantum description of light, where we'll try to detect quantum signals, especially quantum single photon states. And there we will see how we can co calculate this eta. This concludes our discussion of classical uh, electromagnetic theory and the shortcomings of classical electromagnetic theory. We have hinted that electromagnetic radiation should not really be thought of as a wave. In particular, we should use the image of photons, but still we, don't, we did not describe the clear machinery of mathematics and formalism how to describe various states of electromagnetic radiation. That's what we're going to do in the remaining five lessons of this module. Quite an exciting time. See you there.